What makes someone a good friend? Are they there for you when you need them? Do they live? Laugh? Love? Do they goof around? Or maybe they do all of these things. But in Don't Hug Me I'm Scared, friendship isn't always a buddy-buddy situation. Sometimes it's a master-servant relationship built on possessiveness and insecurity. Starting out just a little annoying before ending up outright terrifying. So I thought it'd be a bunch of fun to join these murder puppets and take a big old look into the horror fun that is Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Episode 4 Bad Friends Now, it seems like Episode 4 is the most controversial of the lot. Kinda like Marmite, you either love it or it's doo-doo. But to me, this episode is easily the most underrated. It's not as scary as some of the others, but it's a nice breath of fresh air before the show starts to get real existential with things. We open up as we always do in this colourful prison world. Same spinning dollhouse, same upbeat jig all about how close our three lead puppets are. But with just one notable difference this time. We live in an actual nightmare! Now that we're past the halfway point of the show, we're getting more and more signs that the mask is slipping. Whoever the puppet master of this puppet show is, they're losing control. This inescapable routine is wearing Red down. But don't you worry, because he forgets this in no time. As we zoom in to the trio's home, and it's revealed to be a special occasion. Not Christmas, not Thanksgiving, but computer day. This seems to be a once a year occasion, as though they're prisoners being given a little treat to keep them going, something to look forward to. And the trio seem to be genuinely very excited about computer day, even Red, who's usually so down in the dumps, screaming about this living nightmare just moments ago, seems much jollier this episode. It's an escape from their usual routine, where at first glance, it seems they have more freedom. I mean, you can do anything on the internet. Why should I be on the internet? Why? It's already got more stuff in it than you could possibly imagine. But really, that lack of control is still there, as even the mouse seems to have a mind of its own, Duck having to use two hands just to control it. You won't get away from me this year. It's unclear whether this is supposed to be the episode's teacher, as we'll soon see the focus taken away from Mr. PC and placed towards someone much more sinister. But we have a big problem, because uh-oh, they can't remember the password. And the password? Me? But I... I don't know the password. Yellow's constant confusion we've seen throughout the show is starting to affect not just himself, but the whole trio now. Um, Hurry up, we need uh, to get online. He seems to especially have trouble with his memory. As in the previous episode, it took him just seconds to forget the other two had come along with him on their nightmare slumber party. But despite Yellow goofing up the password, there's still a chance. They just have to complete some tasks to get access. Kind of like when you have to prove you're not a robot. These tasks seem easy at first, clicking which of these is an apple but then it quickly becomes overwhelming in order to throw the trio off, as though the computer is messing with them, making them play a game of guess which farmer at the farmer's market the apple belongs to, but they goof it up. And again, the mouse seems to be to blame for them failing this task, moving the wrong direction at the very last second. It reminds me of so many points throughout the show where the trio are just about to get what they want before it's ripped away from them as though some unknown entity is being a little teased. We just don't know what this entity is yet. Unfortunately, after these computer mind games, the trio accept defeat. Oh well, I guess computer day is cancelled this year. Stupid brain, I know it's in there. Yellow is annoyed with himself. Up until this point in the show, we haven't really seen him have much awareness when it comes to his intelligence. He's had that ignorance is bliss feel written all over him. But now, he's putting himself down, and rather than reassuring him and helping him out, Duck and Red insult him. It's not your fault. Mm. You're just a f <sighs> Not intentionally, it's just they're brutally honest. But before Yellow even has time to react, the episode is stopped in its tracks, bars flickering over the screen. The trio jumping between two frames, back and forth, making it look like they're having a seizure. The episode's been paused, not by us, 
but by this week's antagonist. But if we've already met what's supposed to be this episode's teacher, then who's this? For now, all we get is his voice. If I had to sum up his character with one word, it would be jarring. When he speaks, he has a whiny tone. How dare you? But also just a little bit too much enthusiasm, like the kind a manager might have when trying to make something so menial sound so fun. Now let's see how that should have gone. And these two combine to make it sound like he's constantly just nagging away at you. A little icon pops up in the corner of the screen. Okay, stop. And the mystery voice starts talking. Okay, stop. Did you see what just happened there? Not to the trio, but to us. Almost as though the show has now become one of those corporate employee training videos. Scott, wait! That's not how service should be done. Let's see how Scott should really handle the situation. Using what's just occurred with the trio as a bad example of today's lesson. The F word. Friendship. And what a great choice of using the employee training format. Just like kids puppet shows, these training videos offer up black and white, often misinformed lessons to workers about how to deal with certain situations. Except instead of simplifying these lessons, shortening them into an energetic, fun format, they're dragged out, dull and lifeless. As if adding in fun music to the background will disguise this. Managers how to take charge of the restaurant by pathing, coaching, and directing the crew. At first, it seems like this mystery voice is sticking up for Yellow. Was that the right way to treat somebody? Or was it actually really hurtful and horrible? But we soon learn that he has his own motives. Yellow manages to break from this pause for long enough to ask, <laughs> So we now know that time isn't frozen, just the trio being held in place against their will, stuck listening to everything this voice has to say. Whoever this voice belongs to, they're in control at this moment. And again, just like how these training videos tend to go, the situation is then rewinded, so we can see how it should have gone down. Let's see how Scott should really handle the situation. Or at least how this character believes it should have gone down. And we get our first glimpse at his appearance, as he projects his mouth over Red and Yellow's faces and talks for them. And I like how it's kind of a puppet using another puppet as a puppet. Damn, that's deep. Everything about the look of this episode's antagonist is designed to be annoying. We see that this new fella is soft pink, with nearly a full set of bottom teeth apart from a single tooth. But with his top teeth, it's the opposite. He has just one. So when he closes his mouth, it looks normal. But when his mouth is open, it's almost frustrating to look at. Like, I just want to grab that one top tooth and place it with the others. Most of the teachers who pop up throughout the show offer up misleading lessons about the topic being discussed. But there's at least some truth usually mixed into these lessons. But we see that this pink fella is giving out awful advice before we've even seen what he looks like. In this new guy's point of view, the previous beef between the trio should have been handled like this. How dare you? And how dare you speak to me like that? I refuse to be disrespected ever again! Instead of doing the productive thing, reasoning with the others and explaining that this was hurtful, his advice is to respond immediately with outrage and demands. Two things which tend to escalate an argument the quickest. And in this pink guy's delusional mind, Red would then react like this. I tried to destroy your reputation and I would like to apologise. I was being a bad friend and I'm ashamed of what I have done. This make-believe scenario is so revealing about the new guy's character. Ashamed being the key word out of all of this. He doesn't want the end result of this encounter to be positive, with them both mending the problem as a team. He wants them to feel low because they made him feel low. It's more of a revenge scenario than a meaningful apology. And we then get the reveal of who this annoying voice belongs to. His name is Warren the Eagle. And hey, I'm no biologist, but that's a worm. And this worm stands facing us, the viewer, rather than the characters in the actual scene. Another classic element of those training videos. Every element of his appearance is something which people commonly tend to find off-putting. He's wearing a Bluetooth headset as though he's a cold caller. Someone who I think most people aren't exactly happy to hear from. 
and it's on top of his hat, which isn't even one of these bad boys. None of his colours seem to match. You have soft pink with dark pink and neon green. He has zits all over his body, some of which look ready to burst with pus. And we're not talking the kind of spots which all of us have had at some point or another. No, we're talking cooties level. And this eagle finishes off his training video cutaway by saying, There's nothing wrong with him, and there's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> so now he's brought himself into the scenario when it had nothing to do with him. It's clear this is personal, and the scenario he described is likely an actual conversation he's had, where the first part of the encounter actually happened. How dare you! But there's no chance in hell that whoever he said this to responded the way that he thinks Red would. And this blending of reality and fantasy is something which we will continue to see with Warren. Rather than knocking on the door and introducing himself like a polite boy, he's burst into their home, taken control of their movements, and given them a card with the words Warren the Worm written on it. But Worm has been covered up. And it's a great choice to give Warren these two names right from the get-go because an eagle and a worm probably couldn't be more different. Eagles are seen as powerful. They're apex predators. They're at the top of the food chain. But worms are at the bottom, having to hide away. They are eaten by almost every kind of bird, including eagles. And to us, they're considered slimy, a trait which you don't exactly want to have. Yeah. Ooh, why is it wet? And hey, I think worms are just as cute as the next fella, but I don't think many people are looking for a worm poster or getting worm tattoos, like they are for eagles anyway. Oh, how wrong I was. <laughs> okay, fine. But in most depictions of worms, which people like, the worms are cute and friendly, simplified. Look at this one, he's got a cute little hat on him. So we're seeing the difference in what Warren pictures himself to be and what he really is. He hates the fact that he's a slimy worm man and is in denial about it, telling himself, And some eagles wings, they just take a little bit longer to sprout. So when they do, they're going to be bigger and stronger than normal. <laughs> he's given himself an indefinite deadline to become an eagle, knowing that he never really will. This card also claims he's a certified friendship expert for the same company which we saw the logo of when everything went all pausey, except he's not affiliated with them anymore. It's not mentioned in this episode, but we learn from the paper in the episode Death that he was actually let go due to harassment, and as we continue to learn more about him, that is no surprise. In all of the previous episodes, the trio have been swept up in their teacher's antics with little resistance. Usually one of them is hesitant, but they get on with it anyway. But here, the trio want nothing to do with Warren. It's their special computery day, they haven't got time for this. But as Red swings around in his chair to give the computer access another go, Warren is already right there. You can't get rid of him, the first sign of his clinginess. Warren then confronts Red. Oh, I can see you're right in the middle of something, mate. A string of vicious personal attacks. And as annoying as he is, you can kind of see where he's coming from. They did call him a oh. but in their defense, he did forget the password, and they were just being brutally honest. But now Warren's here, he's making the situation worse, trying to turn the trio on each other. And as they begin having a little chat, Warren snaps at them. Hey, go on fire. Just stop talking amongst yourselves, okay? Now, we're starting to see his bossiness come through. It's clear he's a bit of a control freak and wants everyone to fall in line with his exact plan. But the plan he sees in his head is unrealistic. In his mind, he's going to burst in here, lay out what a genius on friendship he is, they'll all praise his skills, go out for a restaurant-style meal, and become best friends for life. A restaurant-style meal? You see, a restaurant-style meal to Warren is like heaven. When he suggests the idea, his usual loud, obnoxious voice turns quiet and reserved like he's so used to people turning him down. Restaurant-style meal, if you wanted. <laughs> and by asking them to dinner, it's the one time in the episode we see him have any vulnerability. Our first hint that, despite being horrible and annoying, Warren does have a tragic side to him. All he really seems to want is a friend. It's just his idea of friendship is twisted, 
There's no give or take, and it quickly becomes aggressive if you don't do exactly what he wants. There are a lot of similarities between this wormy worm and the twins from the previous episode, as they both seem to have their own intentions, whereas all the other teachers seem to be following the puppet master's will, as though they're just there to do their job. The following song from Warren reveals even more about his motives and what kind of character he is. A gangster rap influenced track from that little worm we hate so much. The visuals are a slideshow which Warren flicks through, telling the tale of a guy he knows. The guy is the same shade of pink, but instead of a worm, it's a normal little kid. Again, in every scenario he describes, he's not a worm. The song starts off sweet and innocent, him and his friends talking on the phone, having a slumber party. Boys night, woo! -hoo. But just like every song in Don't Hug Me I'm Scared, it quickly turns sinister. And he would feel a bit down when he felt like his friends weren't treating him right. So this self-proclaimed friendship expert believes that if you give anything more attention than him at any time, even a cute little bunny you're a bad friend, and that's just a fact. We then learn that because he was having trouble at work, probably because of the harassment, he gathered all of his little buddies around and asked them for help with a business idea, which is almost 100% code for money and investments, something which you should always leave your friends out of. And so, of course, they say no, and this infuriates Warren. In his mind, he's a genius, always making the right decisions, how could you not invest in his master plan? The a mate of mine facade starts slipping. They don't have business brains like me, the him. He's getting riled up and losing control of his words. And the next slide has all of his friends with their eyes crossed out, like a serial killer. The black ink contrasting the colorful, simple image with the line work looking like it was scribbled in a frenzy out of anger. The last time we saw photos with crosses on them was the family members surrounding the family tree from the previous episode. And, well, we know how that ended up. It makes you start to feel anxious for the trio as now Warren is going from annoying to delusional. And hey, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want a delusional stranger singing a little song in my living room unless it was absolutely fire. I am legit feeling a strong 9 to a 10. Oh, this thing. Warren cannot handle rejection and wants everyone, even his own friends, to conform with what he wants. He gives out all these lessons, but doesn't listen to them himself. You'd think that this would be the end of the story, but no, it continues. And this is likely where the story deviates from reality into fantasy. Warren tells his friends they're being bad buds, and instead of doing what likely actually happened and putting this wormy fella in his place, they apologise and beg for forgiveness, which, of course, he refuses, saying it's too late, making himself out to be the good guy in this story, where everyone is just so head over heels to be Warren's friend, and he always comes out on top. I'm playing both sides so that I always come out on top. As Warren begins losing them, and the attention is no longer on him, he pauses them yet again. This pausing power is a great fit, as it makes him quite literally a control freak, stopping the episode and the trio in their tracks any time the focus is taken away from him. He starts talking to us again, and I really wish he wouldn't, hyping himself up, giving himself an inflated amount of importance, saying even I had trouble making friends, as though he's the best to ever live at friend making. Even though the only example he's given ended up with him being alone. And after his sentence is finished, it becomes a quote, as though he's a prominent public figure who people are constantly referencing. He mentions his confidence too, and I guess you could argue that he has some confidence, but to me, there's more than one type of confidence. You have confidence because you're fine with yourself and don't really care what anyone thinks of you. And then there's confidence because you believe yourself to be better than everyone else. But when someone challenges this, underlying insecurities rise up. So was it ever confidence to begin with? Which of these do you think best describes Warren? And as he asks the audience, But how could a confident, handsome, worm ego have trouble keeping friends? Likely about to go off on some reason which again paints him out to be the hero and blames everyone else. 
Red throws out a little guess. Because of the way you look? The fun, quiet music which accompanies his training video breakaways stops in its tracks. This is the first time in the episode that Warren seems to have been taken out of a pause moment, rather than finishing it on his own terms. Red's comment has clearly rattled him, and the trio go on, pointing out all the ways you can insult Warren's appearance. One thing that the trio do have in common is that they're blunt. They don't keep secrets, and tend to say whatever they're thinking. Don't get too close to them. They look feral. And Warren is feeling the full effect of this. The insults quiet down, as digital noise increases in volume, taking its place, as though he's disassociating, trying to block out their hurtful comments. The ringing builds and builds, and it feels like he's about to attack the trio. But instead, when we cut back out, he makes this noise. <laughs> At first, it's hard to tell whether he's laughing or crying, but it turns out it's both. He's laughing on the outside, appearing to the trio like he doesn't care about anything they say, but on the inside, he's devastated by their comments. And this is such a common thing, especially with those who have trouble expressing their emotions. You don't want to be seen as weak even though the strong thing to do is not covering up all of that stuff. Because if you don't find a way to express yourself, you might end up internalizing that hurt and taking it out on other people or yourself. And as it looks like Yellow is dishing out one last little insult. Rat eye. Oh, what's this? He's only gone and remembered the bloody password. Three cheers for Yellow, everybody. The trio are now online flying through what looks like if the Doctor Who intro and a groovy dance floor had a baby. Various things can be seen flying past them. A visual way of showing the limitless possibilities you can get up to on the internet. All the knowledge is just a tippity type away. So, what do the trio do with all this freedom? Email, of course. And when they open it up, the only contact is between the trio. Just as we thought, we might get some information about where everyone in this world is. Instead, we get another reminder that the trio are trapped together. This place seems made for them. So, who else would they have to email? They've gone through all this stress and drama just to do what they always do. Sit in the house and talk to each other. Red and Duck do the email, having a blast. But when Yellow excitedly rushes to check his inbox, it's empty. The only upside to the trio's constant nightmare seems to be that they don't have to face it alone. But now, not only does it seem like Yellow is isolated from the outside world, away from reality living out this puppet show, now he feels isolated from the trio, the only company he has. And so, believing he has no friends, we zoom in to Yellow's head, as his brain goes from having a smile to a frown. Yellow is a very simple character at first glance, the most childlike, and the only two emotions that seem to come easy to him are happy or sad. And when we zoom back out, his face looks as though it's been melted with a blowtorch. The room appears dark, and Yellow has shadows cast all over him. Wind can be heard whistling, as though the shot is barren and empty. We're not looking at Yellow, just his shell. His look reminds me of one of the most famous paintings of all time, The Scream, which depicts a man clutching his head, looking terrified, just like Yellow, looking as though his head is melting and distorting out of its usual shape. This painting is often described as representing the anxiety of the human condition, a visual way of showing negative feelings. And Yellow's design here is using the same trick, having his appearance help emphasise what's happening with his mind. Yellow's journey in this episode is of him battling disassociation, and where he ends up in his thoughts is one of the only places in the show which doesn't feel corrupted and sinister. And even though Warren is the antagonist of this episode, he didn't fully cause this. He may have added fuel to the fire with his awful teachings, but it was Red and Duck's hurtful comments, as well as him feeling excluded, that led to him escaping to his own thoughts. And only he can make the choice to come back. But they put the blame on Warren, probably because the teachers seem to be to blame for pretty much every problem they've had in the show so far, even if they aren't acting alone. And as Warren heads off, his job complete, 
Red realises that he's the only one who can bring him back from his happy place, as he's able to fit through his ear to go and retrieve him. But Warren is selfish, he doesn't care what happens to Yellow, and why would he? They just roasted him to pieces, so he carries on leaving, but Red knows exactly what drives him, his deepest desire, and throws out the possibility of that family-style meal which Warren craves so badly. A warm orange glow comes over Warren as though the pure mention of this has filled him with so much joy. Now, Red has him wrapped around his finger. We zoom into his head through his ear, all the way into his thoughts, which have taken the form of a children's show. Now, I'm pretty sure this is 3D animation made to look like claymation. They've animated it at 12 frames per second rather than the usual 24 to give it that jolty stop-start to look. But we'll talk more about this later on. If you think Don't Hug Me I'm Scared can be bold and colourful, Brain Friends blows it out of the water. Look at the difference in the palette of these two shots, especially the light tones. There's almost never any darkness in the Brain Friends world. No shadows. Looking like a show that would be made for toddlers, with a friendly intro song about their endless adventures. Flying through space, dancing on a stripy, wavy road, and even running through the jungle. The Brain Friends intro resembles the Don't Hug Me I'm Scared intro, but this time, the fun feeling seems genuine. There's no pain here. No red screaming. We live in an actual nightmare! Just pure friendship. But what are the Brain Friends? Unlike the other puppets in the show, they actually do look completely friendly, each one representing a common, happy childhood memory. Leaving your first tooth under the pillow for the tooth fairy, flying a kite, and having a lovely little bubble bath. This character's design is kind of concerning, because we have another little yellow inside of the sentient bath. So, is it alive? Attached to this bath as a living body part? Who knows? The brain friend who sticks out the most is Yumpferdinka, with eyes all over her body, as though she can look in every direction. Her head reminds me of the Cheshire Cat from Alice in Wonderland, a creature on all fours who has human facial features, making her have the uncanny valley feel, where the uncomfortable mix of human and non-human features make it difficult to work out what she is. But I don't think her personality is scary or sinister, especially to Yellow anyway. Just something which a child like him might come up with when doodling, even if I do think her eyes are piercing my soul. The Brain Friends seem to be some of the very few characters in the show who truly have good intentions. They're so supportive. Oh, I can't believe you jumped the love! They feel made by Yellow purely with the intention to cheer him up, away from all the pain in the usual don't hug me I'm scared world. They all seem like genuine friends, every one of them contributing to the conversation. No one is left out, and Yellow seems to be thriving here. Oh, this is the best place. Okay. His usual character design only really allows him to have one facial expression. He can open and close his mouth, but that's about it. But here, his mouth is traditional animation, so it allows him to actually smile for once. It's sad because you kind of wish Yellow could stay here forever, but you know he can't or his body will wither, including his mind, and this fantasy will be lost anyway. And this is Don't Hug Me I'm Scared. Of course this dream can't last. All of a sudden, Yellow's imagination is paused. Warren's here with another pausey breakaway moment. And the imagination is the last place that someone like Warren belongs. He's like a parasite, as soon as he arrives, he stops the fun in its tracks. Wanting Yellow to get out so he can have his prize, hiding behind the reasoning that the brain friends aren't real. It's made up, but really, it seems like everything in this world is made up and not real. He doesn't really believe what he's saying. There's a tad of jealousy here too, as Yellow seems to fit into this friend group with ease, even though it's his own mind, so of course he would. Just like Red, the Brain Friends also seem to understand Warren and what drives him. They compliment him. The things you are saying sound clever. <laughs> and interesting. And tell him exactly what he wants to hear, repeating the exact same lie he told himself earlier. 
Some eagles' wings just take longer to sprout. And some eagles' wings, they just take a little bit longer to sprout. And Shy, imaginary older brother, says something which I say to myself every single day. Why did I say that? It seems like they're willing to allow Warren into the gang if it means that Yellow can stay. They don't ever want this party to stop, even though leaving his mind is probably what's best for Yellow, so his real body doesn't melt away. But then again, they might not know this. They just have their buds back. And if he's gonna leave, he's gonna do so on his own terms. Warren is easily won over by these compliments, likely the first he's heard in a very long time. Yeah, all sort of lumpy and red raw. And so he stays in Yellow's mind. The party's back on everybody. They're back to having a good old time. But this was a mistake, because now that Warren's been accepted, and more importantly, complimented, his ego and twisted idea of friendship are beginning to come through again. Things start off simple, turning off the boombox, which everyone is enjoying, so he can plug in his own stuff, taking control, making it difficult and getting annoyed when they resist. He wants his own way, and by doing so, he poisons Yellow's imagination, making himself the center of attention in someone else's brain. They attempt to get things back on track, but Warren begins bossing around shy older brother, B, G, lowercase. Oh, come on, speak up! Screaming at him for being quiet, his main personality trait that he can't help. The thing which, quite frankly, I find him adorable for. Don't listen to him, shy boy. Yellow's had enough of Warren enforcing himself on his happy place and shuts him down. Backed into a corner, he resorts yet again to pausing Yellow's brain. Despite being accepted by the brain friends, he will never fit in because he can't be a part of a team. And the rule he throws up on screen just shows how deluded he is. Notice how before, everyone was contributing to the conversation evenly, but now, it's all about Warren. He's only doing what he wants, because in a selfish person's mind, they are everyone. He finally connects to the boombox, and instead of playing a song that everyone can enjoy, or even just something a bit different that he enjoys, he plays his own podcast. How you grow your business using new methods. Oh. He wants everyone in the room to hear his voice by force, because he knows that no one will listen to it by choice. There's a constant stream of him talking, so even when the brain friends challenge this and talk up, Warren's voice is still there. I don't understand this song. You can't escape it. The whole brain friend sequence plays like a guy who no one likes, gate crashing a party and sucking the life out of it. After the Joe Warren podcast finishes, we see he has cornered our boy, shy imaginary older brother. And of course, he goes after the shyest one, the one least likely to talk back or confront him. In just minutes, Yellow's mind has gone from a fun adventure to just another prison. Whilst Warren is distracted, the other brain friends escape through a hatch in the floor. The brain friends are so happy and kind, but even they can't be there for Yellow when Warren is around. Warren finally had the chance at being accepted into a friendship group who won't judge him, and he instantly ruins it, making it worse and worse until they leave. It makes me think for sure that Warren's song from earlier in the episode was extremely inaccurate. It's likely the exact same thing happened to those friends, taking Warren's orders until they couldn't be around him anymore and tried to leave. But now I'm starting to wonder if those original friends ended up making it out, as not all of the brain friends are lucky and managed to escape. Those shadows and dark shades, which we often see throughout the show, return to Yellow's mind. And rather than putting up with Warren any more, shy imaginary older brother takes himself out of the situation. The only escape Yellow had has been ruined, turned just as violent and sad as the outside world, all because of Warren. And those closest to him, Red and Duck, are the ones who sent Warren in there to get him. They had good intentions, but now Yellow is alone and being tormented in his own mind trapped with just this possessive worm now. So, will he come back to the real world with Red and Duck, who he thinks hate him? Will he stay here with the awful Warren? Well, neither. Instead, his 3D animated self begins to melt away, and we delve even deeper into his mind, to an even more friendly version of the brain friends, 
where it's even simpler. Just Yellow's head floating around in what looks like a light blue pool, while a soft version of the Brain Friends song can be heard. <laughs> Ooh. If the original was a fun toddler show, then this is a relaxing show for infants. Yellow looks around, admiring it all, sounding a little switched off. <laughs> he seems content. As Yellow travels up the layers of his consciousness, each layer becomes more simple, less and less like reality, less things that can hurt you. It seems as though nothing really speaks here, and so these shapes aren't going to leave him. But again, it can't last forever, as a part of the blue wall substance is peeled away, revealing Warren's face poking through. No matter how far Yellow runs into his own mind, he can't escape Warren and his negativity. And here, this is shown visually when he leans in closer, taking up more and more of the frame, covering up that calm, soft blue and making it uncomfortably intimate. Just like before, he's in control of this place now. You're not trying to get rid of me, are you? We're best friends! He thinks of him and Yellow as best friends, despite Yellow not saying a single kind word towards him. It's more like Yellow's his target, his prey, because it's a one-way relationship which he can't get out of. But he tries anyway, escaping to the final layer of his mind. A black void of nothing, so far removed from his reality now that there's absolutely no resemblance. The layers have been getting simpler and simpler until there's nothing at all, just darkness. And the quiet, calming Brain Friends song is replaced with a song which sounds like deep rumbling. Boo. <laughs> When Warren was outside Yellow's mind, he seemed pathetic, and when he was with the Brain Friends, he became annoying and scary like a tyrant, as though he's gonna snap and attack at any moment if you don't do what he says. But here, he's made out to be terrifying, a monster in the dark who, no matter where you go, even the deepest, darkest part of your mind, somewhere so personal, you can't escape him. He's singing the Brain Friends intro now, but instead of fun or calming, it's high-pitched and turns into a sort of whining cry. <laughs> Even Yellow's subconscious fun song has taken a dark turn now. We get an incredible shot of Yellow alone, surrounded by seemingly endless darkness. Warren could be anywhere. Where is he going to run? He's essentially at the bottom of this one-way mind pit, but as he tries, he resorts back to his usual felt puppet look. Yellow's no longer in a position where he feels like a happier version of himself, and his appearance reflects this. They're so far from the puppet show world at this point, that now Warren has nothing to hide. His real form is showing. Not an eagle, not a normal kid, not even a slightly off-putting, pus-covered puppet. He's a grotesque, realistic lump of slimy flesh. It reminds me of the previous episode when Lily's hand reached onto Yellow's shoulder and changed from plastic to human. The more detailed you try and make these cartoon characters with inhuman proportions and features, the more off-putting they get. It's the same reason that those realistic Simpsons renders give me nightmares. As the small piece of Warren we do see circles Yellow like a shark, we get glimpses of what Red and Duck are up to. They've been using the computer to work out what the problem Yellow might be having is, that there's a worm inside his brain. And you could argue that this is a bit convenient, having them forget something which they set into motion. But we've seen the trio get distracted easily before, so this doesn't really affect my enjoyment of the episode as a whole. Duck whips out his tools, and they prepare to play a quick game of Operation to get rid of Warren. Back in the void, Yellow looks around in every direction, but he can't see Warren. I think it's always more impactful when Yellow gets put in the terrifying situations, because his voice is usually so monotone. But I... I don't know the password. So when it becomes scared and shrill, you know something bad is happening. A slimy wall of flesh moves slightly into frame, whatever Warren has become, 
he's grown and is now towering over Yellow. His idea of friendship fully realised as now Yellow is completely at his mercy. They hold out on giving us a clear look at his new appearance until he's right up and close to Yellow, close enough to harm him. And when they do, rather than cute and simplified like those worm drawings, instead they've gone in the complete opposite direction making him look hyper-realistic, a technique used so many times throughout the show to make us uncomfortable, as we associate puppets with being soft and simple, maybe even a bit fluffy, but here you can see every slimy detail. And even though we know he's a big boy, we're not quite sure how big, but the next shot provides us with a great use of scale. If we didn't have this shot, all we'd have to go by is the short glimpses we get of him against a black void, where there's nothing to compare him to. But we know how tall Yellow is because we've seen him interacting with all the other characters in the show. It helps you understand how truly large Warren has become, like a slimy worm kaiju. The way this scene is framed, using so many horror movie techniques, it's easy to forget that Warren is chasing after Yellow because he wants him to be his friend. He's so deluded, he can't see that Yellow is terrified. Or maybe he can and he just doesn't care. But just before he can reach Yellow, a needle appears from the darkness and goes right through Warren's head, killing him. Duck's game of Operation was successful, and as he pulls Warren out from Yellow's ear, his droopy shell of a body is back to the Yellow we love so much. You get the feeling that, because Yellow definitely would have rejected his friendship in that moment, Warren would have retaliated in anger, going as far as to kill Yellow, or even forcing him to be a puppet in his best friend fantasy. If you met someone like Warren in real life, you might hear people say, oh, they're a bit annoying, but they're harmless. Despite the fact that all of the qualities that he shows in this final scene have been right before our eyes from the beginning, they've just escalated. His possessiveness, bossiness, anger, and need to be in control. If these are things you can pick up after the first minute of seeing a character, then it's safe to assume the more you get to know them, these traits will come out more and more. So, what's the aftermath to all this craziness? Despite saying some pretty cruel words to Yellow about him being a big old dum-dum, Red and Duck reveal they do care for him and think of him as a friend. After all, they've spent all of their computer time trying to get him back. In an uncomfortable situation, Yellow went right to the worst case scenario. Something which all of us are a little guilty of at one point or another. At least I know I am. One mean word? Well, they hate me. And sometimes it's easy to forget that, of course, friendships are more complex than that. The trio may fight at times, but they spend all of their time together, so it's inevitable that at some point, harsh words are going to come out. And Red and Duck seem to understand this a bit more. They're older and so are a bit more aware. They're more sceptical of the lessons taught to them, as at this point in the show, every single one of them has turned out to be misleading or even outright wrong and Warren's breakaway lessons are no different, yet Yellow still nods along to them. Whereas, the only time that Red complies is when he's promised something he wants. Like in the previous episode, when he was given the chance of a new family, one that understands him, dangling in front of him as bait, a chance at a different life. Something which really takes the focus in the next episode I'll be discussing. Red describes Yellow's whole ordeal in this episode his disassociation and his worries about friendship as down to the worm in his brain. Something which we all have rattling around up there in the old noggin. A force of negativity which puts us down. And if Warren was anything, it was negative. Red Worm tells him he doesn't have the body type to rock this absolute fit. And I'm happy he shuts that down because Red, you look fit as fuck mate. We get a song from all of them in unison now. They're back as a team. We're beginning to see a pattern now. The trio start out on decent terms before they're slowly divided by the episode's teacher. Then they come to the realisation that they're all they have, but it never lasts. As they jam out, Yellow zones out a little and breaks the new funky computer gift they were just given, and they begin turning on each other in an instant. You idiot! <laughs> Don't say that to me, I didn't Shut mean to. Yeah. What? I said, you said Turn that you on me. Talk. Just like always, the trio are incapable of having a happy ending. 
Even if, just seconds before the credits roll, they've reconciled, the final shot is never a wholesome one. And this is going to get worse over the final two episodes, especially five which might have my favourite ending out of the entire show. So subscribe and hit the bell if you don't want to miss that one. Now, I want to talk about some of the reasons why I think this episode seems to be people's least favourite. I have to admit, originally I wasn't even going to do a video on this episode, because back when I wrote all of these videos about two months ago, I just didn't think I had enough to talk about. It's kind of funny because I thought, okay, I'll cover episode four, but it will just be a bit shorter than all the others, and now I think it's like my longest one, which is... Of course it is. <laughs> but as I rewatched it over and over, it really grew on me and I started to notice things which I hadn't noticed on my first viewing. As always, all of the set design and character design is just on top of its game. But that being said, let's carry on and discuss some of the opinions that the community has on friendship. Now firstly is the 3D animation. It's made to look like stop motion, but it isn't. And this can be a little bit odd at times because your brain's telling you it should be more janky, but I think they pulled it off as well as they could. And after my first viewing, it really didn't distract me or take away from the episode at all. And I can understand completely why they did this. Don't Hug Me I'm Scared is on channel 4, and so it's free, with all of their revenue coming from ads. But this means you can only watch it in the UK. So it's hard to tell how well the show's actually done. It's got a very dedicated fan base, but that doesn't always indicate streaming numbers. And so I can't imagine that the budget is massive, even if it does look like a billion pounds. These kind of British shows don't tend to have the same high budgets as a household name like House of the Dragon does, especially on their first season. And stop motion animation is incredibly expensive. Not that 3D animation is cheap by any means. But with this amount of colourful characters moving as much as they do, and this many different backgrounds being shown for such a short period of time, it's probably just more feasible to do this in 3D. Let's talk about the character of Warren. He's so incredibly annoying, and that's intentional. But I think they might have done their job a bit too well because we care for and relate the most to the trio. And so when he's annoying them, it feels like he's annoying us as a viewer. And so I think in some way, I kind of associated this episode with Warren and my huge amount of dislike for that slimy worm man. When editing this video, I had to spend ages listening to him and now I'm scarred for life and I wouldn't change a thing. But I can see why someone might skip this one on a rewatch to avoid the wrath of Warren. Make, make it, it clear from the outset make it stop. I am no longer a And the final reason is that there's just not as much mystery in this episode. Theories are such a big part of the fun, and this one doesn't have as many clues towards the bigger picture other than Red's nightmare scream. We live in an actual nightmare! It's all laid out pretty straightforward, at least when compared to other episodes. They say out loud the meaning of the episode at the end. That's just the worm in your brain. Or maybe it's something else, or you just don't like it. It's not your cup of tea. Everyone has different tastes. Even in a masterpiece show, one of the episodes has to be the one you remember the least. But yeah, I still really enjoy this episode. Let me know what you think of it in the comments. Where would I personally rank it? Well, that's for another video. Speaking of, next Don't Hug Me I'm Scared video will be a ranking of all the songs throughout the show. You know, a little bit of a breath of fresh air. So uh, yeah, subscribe and stay tuned for that. And all the theories in the comments are so cool to see. You guys are like detectives out there. So yeah, keep them coming. Ah, well, I'd love to stay in chat, but DJ Eagle is signing autographs down the street and I don't want to be late. Thank you. I love you. Goodbye.